Can two walk together without having met? The verse comes from Amos, the Hebrew prophet who described himself as a cattle breeder and a tender of sycamore trees, figs. It's a rather humble description for someone who bequeathed us great poetry. It's a bit like former President Jimmy Carter describing himself as a retired peanut farmer or Rihanna introducing herself as a former army cadet. Amos, after all, has given us one of the world's most famous verses. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I suspect you know those words. What you might not know is that their author provided the inspiration for a practice that is central to Unitarian Universalism, the creation of covenants. Hebrew is a notoriously difficult language to render into English, and so there are many alternate translations of our text. A couple of them. Do two walk together unless they have made an appointment? Can two walk together except they be agreed? However the words appear, the passage and their author are profoundly important for our tradition. They inspired our religious forebears to develop a kind of religious institution that was different than the ones that dominated the society of their day and continue to dominate ours. Rather than unite around creeds, statements of belief, they would come together by making a set of promises to each other. These they called covenants. In our tradition, each community develops its own covenant. Survey the covenants of contemporary Unitarian Universalist congregations, and you will find a wide array. Some speak of God. Some are silent on the divine. Some are long, detailed statements of intent. Others rely on more poetic language. Whenever we gather, we tend to make covenants amongst ourselves. If you have children in our religious education program, or attended our religious education program as a youth, or have participated in one of our adult discussion groups, you are likely familiar with the process. It tends to go something like this. You show up to a group, a discussion group, a youth group, it does not matter. And at the first session, the facilitator asks everyone to start a list of the things that they expect of each other. You might answer by saying that you anticipate people will listen. Your friend may suggest that each person speaks only their own truth and not for others. Someone could make a statement that they want to make certain that everyone has the opportunity to talk. And so it goes until you have a set of things that you agree will guide your behavior for the time you are together. You're probably aware that the members of the First Unitarian Church of Houston have just undergone a similar effort. The Committee on Vision, Mission, and Covenant was charged by the board to help you answer the question, what kind of church do you want to become? The committee spent almost a year gathering your input in an effort to, an your input in an effort to answer the question. And they've done an extraordinary job. Before we go further, I want to pause here and ask you to give them a round of applause. because over the last months they've gotten more than half of the congregation to participate in one of their discussion groups or fill out one of their online surveys. They've shared with you draft documents and you've shared with them your thoughts on how to improve the texts. In the end, 
they've come up with three statements that each answer a question about what kind of religious community you aspire to be. The first of these statements is the proposed covenant. It answers the question, what does it mean to be a member of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston? The second statement is your vision. It responds to the query, as a religious community, what it is that we want to do in the world. And the third statement is your mission. It answers the question, how are you going to live out that vision? Last Wednesday, the board met and voted to present the proposed texts of the covenant, vision, and mission to you for your approval at a March 5th congregational meeting. I hope it will be an exciting event and one in which I hope you will attend. We'll offer you the opportunity to set your intentions for the future of this congregation. Between now and then, I'll be preaching three sermons, one on covenant, one on vision, and one on mission. We begin with covenant. We do so for theological reasons. Covenants are what bind Unitarian Universalist communities together. And as we've been considering the future of First Unitarian Universalist, we've been trying to understand what it is that we promise each other. The proposed covenant is the committee's best effort to put those promises into words. Even though it's on the back of your order of service, I'm going to read it again. Love is the spirit of our congregation. Service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to encourage one another. Thus we do covenant. Thus we do covenant. In the words of Alice Blair Wesley, one of the preeminent scholars of the theology of covenant, such covenants are meant to express shared mutual loyalties. Loyalty is quite the word for her to pick. It implies to give something a consistent and dependable support over time. In thinking about our covenant, and as well as our vision and mission, I encourage the committee to think beyond just what you shared with each other in your online servings and discussion groups, I urge them to think about the history of First Unitarian Universalist. What, it is, what is it that the members of this congregation have consistently demonstrated your loyalty across time? A faithfulness to the spirit of love is without question your core loyalty. It's something that many of you have strived to live out decade after decade ministry after ministry. I'll share more with you about how the congregation has historically lived out your loyalty in my sermon in a couple of weeks on the proposed vision, Widening Love's Circle. This morning, I'm going to give you a single historical example. Love is the spirit of our congregation. Now, I don't know if you've been up on the second floor recently, but if you have, you probably noticed that we're in the process of a small construction project. The library is being remodeled. Part of the library project has been organizing our archives. We have over 100 years worth. They take up a lot of space, almost half of a room. Knowing this, I picked up the phone and spoke to my old friend Gloria Korsman, Gloria is the librarian at the Harvard Divinity School who oversees the Unitarian Universalist collection. She let me know that they would be delighted to house our archives. So sometimes later this year, we'll be shipping over 60 boxes off to Cambridge. Once they're there, they'll be more accessible than they are now because Gloria and her team will painstakingly catalog everything that we ha send to them and they'll be responsive to requests for the digitization of materials. So if we need information about, say, what happened at a board meeting in 1963, and if we give them a reasonable amount of time, they can send us a long uh, scan of the document in question. As a historian, I can tell you that the archives uh, being up in Massachusetts mean that there'll be a resource not just for members of our congregation or researchers 
connected with Unitarian Universalism. They'll be of interest to people studying social movements like the Civil Rights Movement, the LGBTQ Movement, the Women's Movement, and the Sanctuary Movements. All the times this congregation has testified to its commitment to the spirit of love. It's because of the work of a young scholar at the University of Houston named Allison Senez that we're going to be able to send our archives off to Harvard. You see, we can't just pack up a bunch of cartons and ship them on their way. We have to provide the archivists with some sort of sense of what there is inside of them, especially given the scope of material. Allison's been writing her dissertation on the history of the sanctuary movement. As part of her research, she organized our archives so that we know what the contents are of each box. And now we can find previous sermons from other ministers, board minutes from the 1930s, and membership rolls from the 1940s. There's even a helpful folder containing a photocopy of the page where the famous journalist Walter Cronkite signed the membership book when he was a young man. His father, father was president of the board in 1930. Allison is interested in our community because, as you might know, moved by the spirit of love, First Unitarian Universalist played an important role in the work of providing refugees sanctuary as they fled the CIA-inspired Central American Wars of the 1980s. People like Rita Saylor did heroic work helping to turn our sanctuary into a literal sanctuary where those political refugees could stay while they sought asylum or tried to get to Canada. Now, I didn't know just how significant of a role First Unitarian Universalist played in the whole sanctuary movement until Allison started her research. Did you know that we were the first congregation in Houston to offer sanctuary to Central American refugees? Actually, we were one of the first in the entire country to do so. This fact last month brought a performance to us called Little Central America in 1984. Did you get a chance to see it? Put on by Elia Arca and the professor and playwright Ruben Martinez, it recalled some of the atmosphere of the time. In it, performers included a fragment of Bob Shibley's sermon, Sanctuary, where he convinced the congregation to serve as a sanctuary congregation. It was an act to which, quote, Bob, the members of First Unitarian Universalists could live out the way love and justice transcend ordinary life. In other words, it was a testament to how love is the spirit of this congregation. Bob's sermon is one of the most important ever preached from your pulpit. It was of sufficient note that just last month, the Houston Chronicle quoted it. Almost 40 years after he gave it, it still has influence. The spirit of love, when it becomes palpable, can have an impact that stretches across time. Thanks to Allison's help, we've been able to influence, locate some of the congregation's other influential sermons. We can now find a copy, for instance, of Horace Westwood's account of his time in Selma, Alabama, marching with Martin Luther King Jr. We're going to have these sermons digitized before they're sent off to New England so that we'll continue to have access to them here and learn from them. Love is the spirit of our congregation. While I was preparing for this sermon, I was able, for the first time really, to go back and read earlier sermons about First Unitarian Universalist Covenant. I've shared with you in the past portions of Horace Westwood's 1959 sermon, An Interpretation of Our Covenant, in which he reflects on the covenant that the founders of First Unitarian Universalist adopted when they gathered way back in 1914. It read, in the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for worship of God and the service of man. The text comes from Charles Gordon Ames, a 19th and early 20th century Unitarian minister and liberal Christian. As was for the practice of Unitarians, it was affirmed by all who joined the congregation for some five decades. 
In Horace's 1959 sermon, he reminded the congregation that it was a creedless community. The covenant was to be interpreted, in his words, as a line of poetry that can be as profound, as high as the mind is high, and as deep with feeling as the soul is sensitive. He also told the congregation, there is nothing to prevent us from changing this affirmation by the action of the congregation duly assembled for such a purpose. Soon afterwards, in 1962, the congregation underwent a process to identify a new covenant, which read, in freedom we search for the meaning of life, some find reality in man and the universe. Others find it in God. We express our faith in service to our fellow man and in sincere commitment to the highest we know. As I shared with you last May, this covenant quickly fell into disuse. While the Ames covenant had been recited at every service or at least printed on the order of service, the 1962 text was soon forgotten. Rooting through the archives, I was able to get some sense as to why. We have an incomplete record of our sermons, but from the sermons we do have, it appears that the subject of covenant was preached upon infrequently at best and almost never at worst. As near as I can figure, after Horace's 1959 sermon, the next substantive sermon preached on the subject of covenant came in 1998 when Gail Lindsay Mariner, her last name was Weaver at the time, offered one titled Promises to Keep. It's an engaging piece of writing that traces the history of Unitarian Universalist Covenant to the ministry of the Reverend John Robinson, a clergyman who rebelled against the Church of England way back in 1607. Robinson, she tells us, was distressed that the government required citizens to be members and financial supporters of the state religious institution. He believed that religion should not be compulsory. It should be voluntary. And congregations should not consist of people who are obliged to belong to them. Instead, they should be voluntary groups where the legitimate authorities were the members themselves and the spirit as they might come to know it. In response to his advocacy, the bishops promptly stripped him of his parish <laughs> and outlawed his preaching. He countered by bringing together a small group of independent souls and they created their own congregation. The congregation formed around a covenant. In its members' words, in fellowship to the of the gospel, to walk in all of God's ways, made known or to be named, known unto them according to their best endeavors, whatever so it should cost them. You might know that the congregation that Robinson and his friends formed became in time the first parish church in Plymouth, Massachusetts the historic Unitarian Universalist religious community that is better known as the Church of the Pilgrims. There's a lot to be said about that church and our tradition's connection both to its legacy of religious freedom and all, the awful project of settler colonialism. But I want to leave that to the side for the moment. We'll return to both later in our sermon on vision and mission to ask you a question and make an observation about Gail's sermon. The question, do you hear the words of Amos within the Pilgrim's Covenant? There they are in the statement, walk in all God's ways. We contemporary Unitarian Universalists would not necessarily endorse the explicit invocation of the divine in a covenantal statement. And when the Unitarians parted ways with the Congregationalists back in the early 19th century, Part of the dispute was over this passage of Amos. The Congregationalists were more conservative in their theology. They claimed that in order to walk together, and I apologize for the ableist language, but it's what's in the historic text, people had to have agreements about certain beliefs. A covenant was not enough. They needed a creed. 
the Unitarians responded that the covenant was sufficient. It brought together the community around their shared loyalties, and in the words of Conrad Wright, another theologian of covenant, mutual obligation. At the same time, they asserted, in Wright's words, diversity of opinion is a good thing and a source of creativity, even of life itself. Love is the spirit of our congregation. For all its historical and theological adroitness, there's something rather strange about Gale's text. It makes no reference to the covenant of this congregation. It does not say how you have chosen to dwell together. Instead, it offers a reflection on covenants in general. Now, I don't want to be heard as criticizing either Gale or Horace, or any of the ministers that came between them. What's clear to me, though, is that since the late 1950s, a practice of regular reflection on the covenant of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston has not been part of congregational worship life. The next sermon that I found centered on covenant was from 19, sorry, not, was from 2004, when Bruce Bodie told you that covenants are based on the practice of right relation over right belief. And it appears that after that, the sermon that I gave last May was the next sermon preached on covenant. Now, this is not to suggest that covenant has not been part of congregational culture. As I stated earlier, visit the religious education program or an adult discussion group and you're almost certainly certain to experience the process of covenant making in action. It is to suggest that the habit of regular reflection on our shared loyalties, what promises we make each other when we become part of the congregation, has not been a strong part of your worship life. Love is the spirit of our congregation. The 1962 con covenant, the one that did not stick, does not use the word love. Instead, it hinges upon the word freedom. Freedom is very important for Unitarian Universalists. We are people who believe that the freedom to make our own combinations, to form our own groups, is fundamental. We understand, as James Luther Adams, another Unitarian theologian who wrote about covenant, said that human beings individually and collectively become human by making commitments, by making promises. The groups we form, the groups we are part of, define us. We are social creatures. We believe that to find freedom, we must find it through participation in a group that both offers us space to explore the freedom of our own beliefs and at the same time to affirm, in Adam's words, what holds the world together. Trustworthiness, eros, love. The spirit of love is what binds us together. Adam's was certain of that and so am I. I imagine that the reason why the 1962 covenant fell into disuse was because it was focused on the wrong thing. In the 21st century, freedom of belief can be found on the internet or over social media. It's much harder to find a community that loves you and accepts you for who you are. Two, two decades ago, Bob Shively gave a centenary sermon when he observed that most people came to our congregation for the sense of community that they found lacking in their lives. Reviewing First Unitarian Universalist's then 100-year history, he observed that across that span, people have always come for human affection. Love is the spirit of our congregation. It's my hope that by placing love first in the proposed covenant, you will have created an enduring, enduring statement of congregational loyalty. And if you have, then I want to tell you that your experience will not be entirely unique. The period of time when the theology of covenant was not preached from your pulpit coincides with the same time that Unitarian Universalists overemphasized freedom of belief to the detriment of love and largely 
forgot the practice of covenant. Read through a similar archive of sermons to ours, and you'll find an equal lack of focus on the theology. Freedom of belief is there, but not so much in a testament about what it means to live out a congregational covenant. At the beginning of this century, Alice Blair Wesley and other Unitarian Universalist ministers, theologians, and lay people of her generation launched an effort to revitalize the practice of covenant amongst us. They believed that a clear articulation of our deepest loyalties, those things to which we commit our whole selves, was essential for both the growth of Unitarian Universalism and the ability of Unitarian Universalists to, in her words, alter positively the direction of the whole society. The Unitarian Universalist Association and a recent port, report on anti-racism within our movement has concurred and observed returning to the practice of honoring covenant is essential in the world in which we find ourselves. Love is the spirit of our congregation. Honoring the covenant of the con this congregation means, I suspect, upholding the spirit of love and recognizing that it comes first before a commitment to freedom of belief. We live in a time when people are more lonely than they ever have been before. This is especially true in the wake of the isolation that so many experienced during the shut-in phase of the pandemic. At that time, many networks of care were disrupted, fractured, and broken. Having talked to so many of you about why you are a member of this congregation, why you come here, why you remain a part of it, I can attest that to be part of First Unitarian Universalist is to know that a sense of community is crucial, and that that community is knit together by the spirit of love. I shared earlier with you about how the commitment to this, that spirit of love led you to support the sanctuary movement in the 1980s. I want to close with two brief vignettes that I think illustrate the ways in which you have manifest the spirit of love within this community. The first comes from a member who's shared her story about her experience visiting the first time, the congregation the first time as a then single monitor in several venues around First Unitarian Universalist since I've been here. And I hope she won't mind if I share the story she shared publicly again. It seems that she visited when her son was very little. Now her boy had a lovely time in religious education on his initial Sunday here, and he felt right at home. And so doing, he did what children did, zipped around quite a bit. After the service on the way out of the fellowship hall, he was so enthusiastic that he rushed right past two elegantly dressed older members of the congregation. Joyce Ambler of Blessed Memory, and Leonora Montgomery. The young mother was mortified and quickly began to profusely apologize. Joyce, or Leonora, I'm not certain which in the story, stopped her and said, oh, don't worry. In this ch church, children come first. Now, some of you might debate Joyce and Leonora's approach to parenting a little bit. But the family in question are, have been devoted members of the congregation for almost 20 years. And I want to suggest that what Joyce and Leonora did in that moment was manifest the spirit of love. They let their visitor, now our member, know that she and her son would be loved and accepted in this congregation. And they demonstrated to her that their highest loyalty, the thing they valued most, was love. My second vignette is about our care team, and it's not really a vignette, it's more of a series of observations. Since I've been here, the care team, alongside other members of the congregation, has repeatedly gone out of their way to care for the elderly and sick who are isolated or alone. They've helped people clean out entire houses so that they could move into assisted living. They've helped people find assisted living. They've taken people on innumerable errands. They've spent hours advocating for folks who are no longer able to take care of themselves. 
They've shown up in hospitals and at hospices to comfort the dying. And they provided a loving presence at memorial services. Love is the spirit of our congregation. Can two walk together except they be agreed? You have answered Amos's query by stating through your actions that yes, two can walk together, two can travel together, so long as they agree upon the spirit of love. You, the members of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston, have done your best to live into that spirit. You've made it manifest in your actions and in your lives. And so, in the coming weeks, as you contemplate the proposed vision, mission, and covenant, I pray that you might covenant to continue to live together in the spirit of love. So that it might be so, I invite the congregation to say, Amen.